The Tragedy of Puddin'head Wilson by Mark Twain. Chapter Three. Roxy plays a shrewd trick. Whoever has lived long enough to find out what life is knows how deep a debt of gratitude we owe to Adam, the first great benefactor of our race. He brought death into the world. Puddin'head Wilson's Calendar. Percy Driscoll slept well the night he saved his house minions from going down the river, but no wink of sleep visited Roxy's eyes. A profound terror had taken possession of her. Her child could grow up and be sold down the river. The thought crazed her with horror. If she dozed and lost herself for a moment, the next moment she was on her feet flying to her child's cradle to see if it was still there. Then she would gather it to her heart and pour out her love upon it in a frenzy of kisses, moaning, crying, and saying, "'They shan't! Oh, they shan't! Your poor mammy will kill you first. Once, when she was tucking him back in its cradle again, the other child nestled in its sleep and attracted her attention. She went and stood over it a long time, communing with herself. "'What has my poor baby done that he couldn't have your luck? He ain't done nothing. God was good to you. Why weren't he good to him? They can't sell you down the river. I hates your pappy. He ain't got no heart, for niggers he ain't, anyways. I hates him, and I could kill him." She paused a while, thinking. Then she burst into wild sobbings again, and turned away, saying, "'Oh, I got to kill my child. Ain't no other way. Killing him wouldn't give the child from going down the river. Oh, I got to do it. Your poor mammy's got to kill you to save you, honey." She gathered her baby to her bosom now, and began to smother it with caresses. "'Mammy's got to kill you. How can I do it? But your mammy ain't going to desert you. No, no, da don't cry. She gwine with you. She gwine to kill herself, too. Come along, honey. Come along with mammy. We gwine to jump in the river. Then troubles this world is all over. They don't sell poor niggers down the river over yonder." She stared toward the door, crooning to the child and hushing it. Midway she stopped suddenly. She had caught a sight of her new Sunday gown, a cheap curtain calico thing, a conflagration of gaudy colors and fantastic figures. She surveyed it wistfully, longingly. "'Ain't ever worn it yet,' she said, "'and it's just lovely.' Then she nodded her head in response to a pleasant idea and added, "No." I ain't going to be fished out with everybody looking at me in this miserable old linsey woolsey She put down the child and made the change. She looked in the glass and was astonished at her beauty. She resolved to make her death toilet perfect. She took off her handkerchief turban and dressed her glossy wealth of hair like white folks. She added some odds and ends of rather lurid ribbon and a spray of atrocious artificial flowers. Finally, she threw over her shoulders a fluffy thing called a cloud in that day, which was of a blazing red complexion. Then she was ready for the tomb. She gathered up her baby once more, but when her eye fell upon its miserably short little gray tow-linen shirt and noted the contrast between its pauper shabbiness and her own volcanic eruption of infernal splendors, her mother-heart was touched, and she was ashamed. No! doling mammy ain't gwine to treat you so the angels is gwine to admire you just as much as they does your mammy ain't gwine to have them puttin their hands up for their eyes and sayin to david and goliath and them other prophets that child is dressed too indelicate for this place by this time she had stripped off the shirt now she clothed the naked little creature in one of Thomas a Becket's snowy long baby gowns with its bright blue bows and dainty flummery of ruffles. Dan, now you's fixed. She propped the child in a chair and stood off to inspect it. Straightway her eyes begun to widen with astonishment and admiration, and she clapped her hands and cried out, Why, it do beat all. I never knowed you was so lovely. Mars Tommy ain't a bit prettier, not a single bit. She stepped over and glanced at the other infant. She flung a glance back at her own, then one more at the air of the house. Now a strange light dawned in her eyes, and in a moment she was lost in thought. She seemed in a trance when she came out of it. She muttered, "'When I was a washin' him in the tub yesterday, he owned Pappy asked me which of em was his'n.' 
She began to move around like one in a dream. She undressed Thomas a Becket, stripping him of everything, and put the tow-linen shirt on him. She put his coral necklace on her own child's neck. Then she placed the children side by side, and after earnest inspection she muttered, "'Now who would believe clothes could do de like of dat? Dog my cats if it ain't all I can do to tell t'other from which, let alone his pappy!' She put her cub in Tommy's elegant cradle and said, "'You's young Mars Tom from dis out, and I got to practice and get used to memberin' to call you dat, honey, or I's gwine to make a mistake sometime and get us both into trouble. Dah, now you lay still and don't fret no more, Mars Tom. Oh, thank de Lord in heaven, you saved, you saved. Dey ain't no man can ever sell Mammy's poor little honey down the river now.' She put the air of the house in her own child's unpainted pine cradle, and said, contemplating its slumbering form uneasily, "'I'm sorry for you, honey. I'm sorry. God knows I is. But what can I do? What could I do? Your pappy would sell him to somebody, sometime, and then he'd go down the river, show, and I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't stand it.' She flung herself on her bed and began to think and toss, toss and think. By and by she sat suddenly upright, for a comforting thought had flown through her worried mind. "'Tain't no sin. White folks has done it. It ain't no sin. Glory to goodness, it ain't no sin. Day's done it. Yes, and day was the biggest quality in the whole billin, too. Kings!' She began to muse. She was trying to gather out of her memory the dim particulars of some tale she had heard some time or other. At last she said, "'Now I's got it.' Now I remember. It was dat old nigger preacher dat told it, the time he come over here from Illinois and preached in de nigger church. He said dey ain't nobody can save his own self, can't do it by faith, can't do it by works, can't do it no way at all. Free grace is de only way, and dat don't come from nobody but jis the Lord. And he can give it to anybody he please, saint or sinner. He don't care. He do just as he's a minder. He select out anybody to suit him, and put another one in his place, and make the first one happy forever, and leave t'other one to burn with Satan. The preacher said it was just like they done in England one time, long time ago. The queen, she left her baby laying round one day, and went out calling, and one of the niggers round about the place that uh, was most white, she come in and see the child laying round, and took and put her own child's clothes on the queen's child, and put the queen's child's clothes on her own child and then left her own child laying round, and took and toted the queen's child home to the nigger quarter, and nobody ever found it out, and her child was the king by by, and sold the queen's child down the river one time when they had to settle up the estate. Dah, now, the preacher said it his own self, and it ain't no sin, case white folks done it. Day done it, yes, day done it. Not only just common white folks, neither, but the biggest quality day is in the whole billin'. Oh, I is so glad I remember about that. She got light-hearted and happy and went to the cradles and spent what was left of the night practicing. She would give her own child a light pat and say humbly, Lay still, Mars Tom. Then give the real Tom a pat and say with severity, Lay still, Chambers. Does you want me to take something to you? As she progressed with her practice, she was surprised to see how steadily and surely the awe which had kept her tongue reverent and her manner humble toward her young master was transferring itself to her speech and manner toward the usurper, and how similarly handy she was becoming in transferring her motherly curtness of speech and peremptoriness of manner to the unlucky heir of the ancient house of Driscoll. She took occasional rests from practicing and absorbed herself in calculating her chances. They'll sell these niggers to-day for stealing the money, then they'll buy some mo that don't know the children, so that's all right. When I takes the children out to get the air, the minute I's round the corner, I's gwine to guam they's mouths all round with jam, then they can't nobody notice they's changed. Yes, I gwine to do that till I's safe, if it's a year. They ain't but one man that I's feared of, and that's that Puddin'head Wilson. They calls him a Puddin'head and says he's a fool. My land, that man ain't no more fool than I is. He's the smartest man in this town, lessen it's Judge Driscoll or maybe Pem Howard. Blame that man, he worries me with them ornery glasses of his'n. 
I believe he's a witch. But never mind. I's gwine to happen round dere one of these days, and let on dat I reckon he wants to print a chillin's fingers again, and if he don't notice days changed, I bound dey ain't nobody gwine to notice it, and den I's safe, sho. Sure. But I reckon I'll tote along a horseshoe to keep off the witch work. The new negroes gave Roxy no trouble, of course. The master gave her none, for one of his speculations was in jeopardy, and his mind was so occupied that he hardly saw the children when he looked at them, and all Roxy had to do was to get them both into a gale of laughter when he came about. Then their faces were mainly cavities exposing gums, and he was gone again before the spasm passed and the little creatures resumed a human aspect. Within a few days the fate of the speculation became so dubious that Mr. Percy went away with his brother, the judge, to see what could be done with it. It was a land speculation, as usual, and it had gotten complicated with a lawsuit. The men were gone seven weeks. Before they got back, Roxy had paid her visit to Wilson, and was satisfied. Wilson took the fingerprints, labeled them with the names and with the date, October the 1st, put them carefully away, and continued his chat with Roxy, who seemed very anxious that he should admire the great advance in flesh and beauty which the babes had made since he took their fingerprints a month before. He complimented their improvement to her contentment, and as they were without any disguise of jam or other stain, she trembled all the while and was miserably frightened lest at any moment he— But he didn't. He discovered nothing, and she went home jubilant, and dropped all concern about the matter permanently out of her mind. End of chapter 3